Uh, Rob Sampson and I met, uh, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago here at the University of Chicago um, when he was uh, just launching uh, this extraordinary uh, neighborhood mm -hmm. project. Um, he, he continues to be the scientific director of the project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods. And I just chatted briefly with Professor Sampson to learn that the MacArthur Foundation has uh, funded a, a new phase of that study to do further longitudinal studies uh, here and in Los Angeles, uh, which will allow, uh, this is staggering, a 16-year follow-up uh, for the birth cohort who were originally in enrolled in the project. Uh, I, I was saying to Rob that when I came to the University of Chicago, Shep Kellum and his colleagues uh, had just launched the Woodlawn Mental Health Project, uh, another extraordinary longitudinal study that, that also was in the field for 20 or 25 years uh, on the mental health of children uh, born and raised in the Woodlawn community. Um, R Rob, uh, when I first met him, was here at the University of Chicago in the Department of Sociology, uh, had previously been at the University of Illinois <coughs> in Ur Urbana-Champaign, um, and, um, and has chaired the sociology department at Harvard uh, for the past five years. He's a senior research fellow at the American Bar Foundation, um, and I believe this year is visiting at the Russell Sage Foundation okay. in New York, uh, w working on, on his latest book. Um, uh, I'm just delighted to, to welcome him to Chicago, to invite him here. You want to know the title of the book? <laughs> What's the title of the book? I'll tell you at the end. <laughs> what, tell us at the end. And uh, Rob's talk to us today is going to be on the social reproduction of health disparities, lessons from the Chicago Neighborhood Project. It's a delight to welcome you, Rob. Thank you, Mark. So I guess I have to uh, shout and talk loud. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, it's a delight to be here today. And uh, as Mark noted, um, I taught here at the University of Chicago for about um, 12 years. So in a way, this is like coming home intellectually. So um, that's very nice. I see a lot of new faces, which is also nice. Um, but it's also uh, returning home, so to speak, in terms of a city that um, I've studied um, quite a bit, along with a number of colleagues. And what I thought I'd do today is to walk you through um, some of the results from the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods, which started in about 1995, give you an overview of some key results, and then focus in on a set of more recent findings that take advantage of some of the longitudinal data to address some of the controversies and issues that arise when one studies um, neighborhood effects. And I've long been interested in that, and I can imagine you got a, a nice uh, grounding last week with Kate Cagney's presentation on neighborhood effects, so I probably don't need to give you sort of a, a theoretical overview. But let me start with just some sort of meta um, theoretical uh, thoughts here in terms of how I see the literature. It seems to me that there's two um, general perspectives that dominate the social sciences, actually, and beyond. And, and one starts and, and ends, actually, with the individual as the unit of analysis, the unit of inference, and even the unit of treatment. Dare I say, the medical model is focused heavily on um, the individual. And in that paradigm, individuals are thought to decide and, and select various outcomes autonomously, such that neighborhood contexts and pretty much every other social context is seen as an outgrowth of those individual selection decisions. So you can think of rational choice, although that's not the only thing. I think it's a more general approach that focuses in on individual choice. Now, to the extent that individual choice is important, that has um, led to a critique of a large number of studies that look at social context with the idea that there is selection bias, Na namely that individuals are differentially selecting into environments. I want to probe that um, today and, and show you some information on, on actually how, what selection looks like. Um, basically what I argue is that 
these, this dominant perspective has it wrong. That selection bias is not a nuisance or some kind of a statistical problem, but rather it's a fundamental social process that has social properties, social causation. And in fact, in the end, I argue that selection is a neighborhood effect. Secondly, um, at the other end, you have a critique that says something like large-scale structural forces overwhelm individuals and neighborhoods. Think globalization, think large-scale economic <coughs> changes. You've heard the narrative. Um, it doesn't matter who we pick. It's pretty much the same thing. If it's Thomas Friedman, the world is flat. Um, if it's theorists of um, social uh, phenomenon from this perspective, it's the idea of placelessness, right, that we're rendered um, sort of we can be anywhere, and of course, everyone is on their iPhones walking down the street, and therefore, if you can be anywhere, then your particulars of your somewhere don't really matter. And so that critique sort of comes at it from top down, that is structural factors overwhelm both. Now, um, what I'm going to argue is that the intermediate level of social organization in the contemporary city is, is fundamentally important, that it, it links these different levels, that one is not subservient to another, one is not above another, and I'll talk about selection bias from the ground up. And I'll talk about how some of our research is trying to deal with some of these structural or uh, beyond neighborhood factors. So with that little preamble, let me try to motivate a little bit um, why one would be concerned with some of these issues, in particular, um, and relevant to the title of the talk, why should one be concerned with the social reproduction of inequality or the social reproduction at the neighborhood level? Well, there's some good reasons, and that is the fact that there's a deep structure, a deep continuity to neighborhood social organization, as I will show you. It's not to say the same neighborhood never changes, but it, what I am going to argue is that there's a fundamental process that links neighborhoods and has a, a continuity over time along a number of different dimensions. And by the way, um, theoretically, this... Um, should not be surprising at, at some level if we think um, uh, broadly and even go back to, you know, outside our individual disciplines. I thought um, Lewis Mumford, some of you uh, may have read, the great student of the city, um, wrote Culture and City in 1954 and other works, uh, once said, quote, neighborhoods in some primitive, inchoate fashion exist wherever human beings congregate, which gets at the idea that there's, a, in a sense, a social selection or a sense of, of affiliation and homophily, really, by neighborhood. And last year, actually this year, 2010, half a century later, the archaeologist who does wonderful work, Michael Smith, based on research around the world, claims that, and I quote, the spatial division of cities in districts or neighborhoods is one of the few universals of urban life from the earliest cities to the present. He, he, this bases on archaeological work going back to, to ancient cities, showing spatial Division is a fundamental social form. All right, social form, Chicago. That's where we're at. Um, that's where I study. I can talk about other cities. You know, you can say, well, LA is different and, and Bogota is different and so forth. I, I'll try to answer those questions, although I'm not sure we have time. So let's start with a little bit of historical perspective. Now, first thing, I don't know if people in the back can see this. Um, is it high enough? This, these are maps of, of Chicago, of course. And this is from a famous work, Drake and Caton's The Black Metropolis. I don't know if anyone has heard it, of it or read it. It's a, a very thick classic book, sort of rooted in the Chicago School of Sociology. And uh, in the pre-war era, and this was published in 1945, the data were um, collected a bit before that, they showed um, that a number of different phenomena were concentrated ecologically. So you can see, for example, Insanity, tuberculosis, deaths from tuber tuberculosis, infant deaths clustered in areas close to what was then known as sort of the inner um, business district um, near west side, and then south side, and then further south side. Sort of see a, a pattern running down. Northwest side, southwest side is relatively uh, free of these sorts of things. It's 1945. Not just tuberculosis or insanity. Let's look at families on relief, indicator of poverty. Same thing. Illegitimate births. But also, Rob, that Same thing. Extraordinary um, demonstration of, of the highest and the lowest uh, incidence of being in adjacent communities. Exactly. Close by, but yet this 
um, clustering, which is an excellent point. What it shows is the differentiation by neighborhood. So that's the key thing I want you to get out of this, but also a bit where these things are located, because I'm going to show you how it's changed and how it's remained the same. 20 years later, in the um, famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, Moynihan report, he talked about the, quote, tangle of pathology. I'll set aside the word pathology because I think that's incorrect because it, it gives it a medical diagnosis, um, with all due respect. I think it's a, a social um, problem. But what he said is, in our view, the problem is so <laughs> interrelated, one thing with another, that any list of program proposals would necessarily be incomplete <laughs> and would distract attention from the main point of interrelatedness. Things are going together. I just think of it as things go together ecologically. And he had a very prescient point, I think, which is where we should break into the cycle and how is one of the fundamental questions facing the U.S. I think this is still the case. The Moynihan Report, despite its flaws, identified a problem, interrelatedness, and his thesis, as I argue elsewhere, really suggested that to break the cycle uh, required a macro intervention, which basically could only come um, from some combination of the state and, and uh, city level policies, but I'll set that aside for a minute. So that's 1965. Okay, 50 years later, after the Drake and Caton report, these are data that we put together. Each dot here is an incident of homicide. Yes, there's a lot of them. This is roughly in the 1993 to 1995 period. These are incidents of low birth weight babies. What you see is concentration, differentiation, but also a spread now toward the west side and a spread further south. So you see both stability and change from that earlier map, but um, clearly, even in this era, it's nothing like you would expect from any kind of random distribution or, or placelessness. Now, that was the 90s, the bad old 90s. I remember when we first started this study, the homicide rate was the highest it had been in decades in Chicago. Violence was a, was a severe problem. Let's go later, and now let's look at what happened over time. These are data that I've um, mapped on the change in poverty over 40 years. And basically, it's not really a surprise to you, but I want you just to remember this as we go through. Um, the Black Metropolis was written basically about the neighborhoods right here um, north of and, and west of Hyde Park in terms of Grand Boulevard, um, Oakland. And what you see is... Um, the dark areas are shaded by racial composition in 1960, and then the pluses or minuses are the changes in poverty that um, occurred independent of a baseline. In other words, changes, unexpected changes, and you can see basically a shift moving south and moving west. So, for example, areas like Austin, which were pre predominantly white in 1960, are now predominantly black and become poorer. Notice the great stability up here. Not only... Uh, maintaining a certain racial composition, but um, poverty levels not, not not just not going up, but actually doing better than expected. That's poverty, so we can see kind of a stability. Racial composition, I think, is very interesting. I call it the asymmetry of change. There's change, but it's in a fundamental direction. This is 40 years now, okay? So what we're doing is this very simple map. It's saying... If I know the racial composition of a community in 1960, what's its racial composition in 2000, 40 years later? What we see is three fundamental patterns. One, segregation then, segregation now. No change. Segregation then, segregation now. The differences in this diagonal are all white or non-black and predominantly black. Okay, the, sort of the stability of those corners. Then we see a lot of communities running up this axis and ending up here. And this is communities that transition dramatically from white to black. Right. So I just mentioned Austin, for example. Went from basically completely transformed its population, Woodlawn and others. But what you noticed is it's asymmetric. It doesn't run in the other direction. In 40 years, and by the way, I did this for the United States as a whole, you'll see in a minute, for other things, um, w and why wouldn't it be? You know, we think of gentrification and, and so on and so forth. Not one community transition from black to white. That's an important point to um, bear in mind. Okay, now you're going to say, well, there's gentrification. Everything, you know, changed with regard to gentrification. Well, let's look at it. Here we are, 
community areas in Chicago. There's a concentrated disadvantage index, which picks up poverty, unemployment, um, constellation of fa factors we're talking about. And here it is in 2000. So the decades of, of the 90s is often thought to be the period of intense gentrification. Well, here's what happened. If I know the level of disadvantage in 1990, I know it in 2000 with a very high degree of accuracy. A couple outliers, but not very much, that did a little bit um, um, better. I'll tell you, you'll see where some of these areas are. Um, and, you know, things improved. You can have a secular change, but the, the positioning of neighborhoods, the status of neighborhoods, how people think about them, um, perhaps, is staying the same. People always say, but yeah, Chicago is unique. It's different. Yeah, it is in some respects. Not with regard to fundamental social processes. I know it looks like a little bit of a blur here, but this is every single, um, and I'm using here census tracts as a proxy for neighborhood right now. This is every single census tract in the United States. 65,000. So this includes rural areas, sub suburbs, L.A., Savannah, Pick your favorite place. It's in here. And this is a simple relationship. Same thing. Concentrated poverty, 90. Concentrated poverty, 2,000. Correlation, 0.89. Correlation, 0.88. Notice out of 65,000 tracks, not that many have upgraded. There's a great degree of stability. Okay, That's the dominant picture. It's just undeniable. All right, let's fast forward. Post-2000, bring you up to date, new data. So what we did here is to gather all the... Um, Incidence of low birth weight babies and infant mortality from the period 2000 to 2005. And what I've done is adjust it by poverty, right? And then, because I believe in trying to show things in a very straightforward but not simplistic way, low, medium, high, just cut at um, thirds. So um, low child health would be areas that have high rates of infant mortality and high uh, rates of low birth weight babies, defined here as um, less than 2,500 grams at birth. And then homicides, only now you might have thought, well, you know, those homicides, what about population size and so on and so forth? Aggregated over um, several years, 3,200 homicides. The stars are proportional to the population. So it's essentially a risk analysis. So the larger the star, the more homicides relative to the population. And what you can see is this is, you know, Drake and Caton all over again, right? Look at this. Areas here, here, um, key community areas, sometimes, as, as Mark noted, adjacent to areas that are both um, doing better in child health and have low risk of homicide. Things are going together here. Finally, uh, I just want to do a few more to, to because people say, well, okay, the economic crisis changes things. Okay. These are data now as of um, 2009. We don't have the census yet, but what I did is to get the index of um, Chicago Housing Authority relocatees plus voucher unit holders. You have to be uh, below a certain income to be a voucher holder. So it's an index of poverty. And this is poverty in 2000. And again, a high correlation. And you see a few communities, and I'll come back to these, that are um, suffering from increases other than what we would expect. Now, my assessment here is that Washington Park and also Englewood and West Englewood are seeing a lot of influx of people that have moved out of places like the Robert Taylor home. So we'll come back to the, to the shift. But the point is there is a, a, a real um, gradation here that's not changing. You know that the crime rate has declined a lot. I purposely showed you 1995 data, 1994, because that was the height of the violence epidemic in Chicago. It's declined a lot, as you know. But this is the violence rate 1995 to 2000. This is the violence rate this year. I've gathered every incident of violence from January through July of 2010. So it's the latest data we can have. It's a straight line, 0 0.90 correlation. The rate is going down, and uh, I can't draw it. I don't want to draw on your screen. That would be horrible. But if I did, and if I drew the secular relationship, it would go like this. So I want, you know, it's, it's a little hard to get your head around, but the point is that secular change is not incompatible with fundamental stability in the relative sorting or the social order of community structures, and that's what you see here. And finally, um, a few more. It's not just poverty. It's not just 
um, crime. Um, I've done a paper. I don't have time to talk about it today. On wh what I'm thinking of is other regarding or altruistic behavior. And, and given the medical audience, I might, thought you might like to see this map um, from the book, which actually takes a study that was done here at Chicago back in um, the late 80s and 90s, Nicholas Christakis and colleagues, on CPR rate given to strangers on the street, that is, conditional on having a heart attack. And what I did is took into account the race, the age, the sex of the victim, the racial composition of the community, other factors of the community. And, and essentially, it's the rate of CPR, right? so, so condition-adjusted CPR. Think of it as helping behavior. And then the other thing we did as part of the PhDCN was a field experiment of sorts. Well, what we did is to essentially go around to each neighborhood, and we had um, self-addressed stamped envelopes with fictitious uh, return addresses, um, J&L financial services addressed to so-and-so with a stamp on it, varied the addressee, um, things about it, like one was a business, one was personal. Inside the letter it said something like, um, you know, I paid that bill, please um, check to make sure your records are correct, and so on and so forth, dropped something like 3,200, over 3,000 letters on the streets. Okay. Then took into account where they were dropped, where they were near, whether it was raining, whether it was windy, what time of day, and so on and so forth. Because you expect, you know, it's raining like today. I came in, it was pouring. And if I saw a letter, I might say I'm late for my lecture, I can't pick it up, or whatever. But the point is that, you know, there's random distributions, and the idea is that, is there variability? Well, there sure is. And not only that, there's variability across types of phenomenon across, in this case, 14 years. The dark areas are areas that have high CPR giving rates, if you can think of it like that. They're more likely. Um, and Hyde Park's doing pretty well. <laughs> you should be happy. Um, kind of there's this corridor here. Um, and the triangles are the letter return rates, where they're the highest. And there's some anomalies here, right? You think, well, very heterogeneous areas, for example. Or the north side, the loop. I mean, you know, I, and I repeated this this summer. And, you know, you loop, people are everywhere. This is Anno me, right? Who gives a damn about picking up a letter when there's all these people? It turns out that that had one of the highest return rates. So something's going on. There's differentiation. There's other regarding and altruistic behavior. And this is the relationship between the 2002 and this is a subset of communities that we did in, in 2010 where the correlation is 0.74. Uh, and this is the um, array with the loop in near north side, the highest. I don't want to focus on that much, too much because this is all motivational to get us into some of the analysis, although that is analysis in the sense that it's showing you, I mean, a, a finding that I would basically say that neighborhood patterns cannot be explained away simply by compositional differences and their social quality of, of life um, issues here. So what do I want to do today? Talk about three things, although mostly um, one and three. I'm going to argue that, again, the selection bias is, and I put it in quotes because I think it's been misinterpreted, selection, I believe in selection, I believe in choice. But every choice we make is embedded in a context, and those contexts affect our choices, and our individual choices affect the context. So we have to understand that as a social structure. I want to argue for the importance of what I'm here calling social climate or the social processes and community well-being. And I think perhaps you can relate to that, to the idea that there's something fundamental about thinking of the rate of well-being in a community or a society that goes beyond the gross national product and even goes beyond the crime rate, right, in terms of trust, in terms of um, altruism in terms of collective action and so forth. And thirdly, the higher order structures that link these various processes. And it's going to get a little abstract at that point, but you can tell me later how you don't like that. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about the project that, that Mark um, noted. I'm just going to fly through this, and I apologize, but um, there's really no other choice. <laughs> Um, given our time constraints here, and that this is a multifaceted project that involved a lot of people. At one point here in Chicago, we had 200 people um, working for eight years collecting the data. And um, it was designed um, in a simple way um, to capture 
the idea which is in the title, that, that is to study development in context, namely development in, in Chicago neighborhoods. That was the, that, the neighborhoods are the only context, just an important context to study on its own. And partly the argument there um, in a paper that Steve Roudenbush um, and I published in 1999 was the notion of ecometrics, that is the development of measures for the study of ecology that are independently valid, that go beyond just the in individual level characteristics. So here's in one slide sort of the, the major components. Think of it as two studies in one. So the argument at the beginning was we're going to study individuals, we're going to take them seriously, we're going to follow them through time, but we're also going to study their contacts independently, not just what do the people say about them or think about them, but independently assess the context. And what we did was community surveys, independent samples of community members, social observations. We rode down the streets with, um, what were they, cheap Cherokees or something like that, with tinted windows, with uh, video cameras and videotape the sides of the street to be able to measure various aspects of social order, disorder, graffiti, garbage, and so forth. This will come up in a minute uh, as being important. We did field experiments like the lost letter drop. We did key informant networks. I'll talk about them a little bit. We sampled organizations such as churches, businesses, um, aldermen, um, the um, religious sector, um, and so forth, and looked at the relationship among community organizations and their leaders. And then, of course, census data and crime data and all the other stuff I've been looking at. And then longitudinal cohort studies, starting with birth, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18. This is technically a sequential cohort or accelerated longitudinal design. As Mark noted, we're following this up, actually not just the birth cohort. We're taking all the birth cohort and then a random sample um, of the um, 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15, and we'll be um, tracking them and, and following them up starting next year. So I'm excited about that. This is just the distribution. You can see it's quite diverse in terms of uh, immigration status, racial status um, of the 6,200 children. Um, I should say that the, um, the study is a study of children and their caretakers. That's important. Right? So we had a, a unit being the child or subject and the caretaker adult. The sampling design was based on an initial neighborhood stratification. I don't know if you can see this, but basically these were ran stratified random sample of neighborhood clusters, and I won't get into that, but we did cluster analysis and used maps and so forth to try to define <coughs> aggregations of census tracts that were socially um, meaningful. And we arrayed it by racial composition of the major uh, groups in Chicago, namely African American, European American, and Latino American or Hispanic, and then a category of mixed. It turned out there were seven categories that is homogeneous on these, and then uh, four categories of mixed, white, black, white, Hispanic, and so forth, and then low, medium, and high um, socioeconomic status, and this is the distribution. So we have a representative neighborhood sample, and then within each we have a representative longitudinal cohort sample. Sorry, all the details, but people get care about that. People move. This is what made it so hard actually, um, for the interviewers, 43% moved at least once. You can see that all of Chicago is covered. This is, you know, basically land. There's no homes down there, as you know, as you drive down um, toward where Daly wanted to put an airport in the early 90s. And um, this is O'Hare, where I just was. So basically, everything is covered and, and you have movement. So the point is there's constant change. So when I say there's a certain continuity or change, what I'm really trying to do is reconcile a really um, significant amount of change that's going on in mobility and choice and selection and so forth um, with stability. And, I mean, stability and change. And you can see that it goes across the United States, too. I mean, there's a sort of down Mississippi, a um, couple East Coast, Florida, Texas, California. Not surprising. People went back to Mexico and back. We follow them wherever they went. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about mobility. What does selection look like? So what we did, and this was a painstaking analysis, but what we really tried to do is to take, get into the literature and really try to figure out what are the fundamental factors that influence people's decisions to move. And there's a good literature on this. Peter Rossi wrote a classic book on this. Why do families move? 
And there are some, you know, pretty straightforward things like income, education, job loss. But we decided to probe this a little bit more, and we looked at things like, I mean, not just the, the usual suspects such as race, ethnicity, but employment, um, occupational status, welfare relief, um, married, cohabitated or not, um, high school diploma, and on and on, immigrant generation, English proficiency. But also, for those of you, um, and, and this is where I think the medical epidemiological literature is quite rich, there's a nice literature going back um, actually to Ferris and Dunham and some of the Doran's work in New York on the idea of drift or how mental um, vulnerability, if you will, is related to either getting stuck or moving. So um, we actually are able to look at this. We have um, we assessed depression, for example, and mental health status in the interview, both um, clinically and non-clinically. So we have um, criminality, depression, social support, the number of ties that people have in their neighborhood or their family. So we really have um, a fair degree of precision on those individual characteristics. We even, in another analysis, <laughs> analyze what I call the big two, right, from uh, Wilson and Hernstein's um, treatise on crime and human nature, but they extended it to a lot of social behavior that said that, look, what's really going on here is IQ, right? So it's not just, let's say, depression or not, but measured intelligence and um, impulsivity or hyperactivity. Now, we could only measure this at the child level, but we did, um, based on some of the older cohorts and then averaging um, within families to get a proxy in a separate analysis of IQ and impulsivity along with these other things. What I want to show you and partly this has been published, and then I'll go into new work, is that, yes, those things matter, but not as much as you would think, and it really collapses down to about two or three things. What I'm showing you here, and I just want to make sure everyone understands, because it's pretty straightforward. This is analysis <clears throat> of movement through time of all our, our families and kids, and the outcome here is the neighborhood. Level. So in other words, you live someplace at time one, eight years later, you live in an, either in the same neighborhood or a different neighborhood, and it's we measure it by median income so we can actually calculate the dollar amount. So think about a mover-stayer model. So you can stay in the same neighborhood. Some people can move out, and the neighborhood can change, right? So you can have a change from even though you stay. turns out the biggest change is from when you move. Whites are red. Others, mainly Asians, are green, um, black, black, Latino, blue. These are the lines for movers and stayers. <coughs> Bottom line is these slopes are parallel. They don't converge, although um, the, the one exception being that um, Asian Americans converge um, to whites. This is all adjusted, controlling for all those things I just noted. Okay. So in other words, your, de your decisions, your IQ, or... Um, depression or income or race are really um, all adjusted here. And what we see is about a $10,000 gap between black and white. So if you're talking about disparities, I mean, I'm, I'm going to focus here um, on disparities, not just in health, but disparities at a more um, sort of general level. Black-white gap is 15000 And I can just show you, if you just focus on this, because this is where you get most of the change. You can see in the next, I'm going to repeat it, but you can see how the individual characteristics explain some of that gap, but they don't explain the overall pattern. So this is unadjusted, right? These are the people that have moved. If we just look at their patterns of moving, and that's the second, um, I'm sorry, there's the second. And what you see is this is like about $73,000 moves down to $65,000. So, I mean, it's doing, yes. So the individual characteristics are accounting for about an $8,000 um, increment, but the gap is still remaining. Now, why is that? Um, so we, we endeavored to explore this more. Um, we also looked at mobility tables in terms of upward and downward mobility, right? Because we, the whole idea behind the selection bias critique, and the often the one you hear is, well, what about the, you know, the family that perseveres in, in high poverty neighborhood and moves to Scarsdale or Winnetka. Well, maybe not Winnetka, but Oak Park or whatever. Well, those are good stories. Um, but the point is they don't actually happen much. Um, 
the action is on the diagonals. If you just take neighborhood median income and you look at the distribution at origin and destination, what you see, for example, if you look at low, even for whites, six, almost 70% remain in the same category. It's higher for blacks, about the same for Hispanics. Or look, if you look at it differently, there's still a racial difference, but um, in each case, it's much less um, than I think common wisdom would allow. If you look at um, downgrading, that's where you see real um, racial differences. So, for example, especially during a time, and, and what I'm going to predict based on our follow-up is we're going to see this increase during the economic recession. That is to say, whites, 1.4%, basically no one, um, were downgraded in terms of their neighborhood status, compo uh, opposed to about 12% of blacks and Hispanics. So a lot of the action then is on the diagonals, and I want to understand that more. So now I want to move up to um, another level of argument. The idea here is relatively straightforward. If I move from Hyde Park to Lakeview, that's an individual decision, an individual choice, but that move, and this goes back to James Coleman and before, right, doesn't just affect me, I mean, that's how we think of it in our individualistic world, but it affects Hyde Park in the sense that I've left people behind, social ties, but I've also moved into Lakeview, so there's a new um, intervention, and there's a tie established. Now, if you think of it in the population level, not about me, but about the flows of people, think about it like a demographer, and Michael, um, I'm sorry, Douglas Massey and his colleagues um, have looked at this with regard to Mexican migration, international migration, right? You have migration flows. So what we're doing here is to think about neighborhood migration as a, as a network. These are community areas in Chicago. These are the nature of moves between um, the neighborhoods, and they're not valued here. That's why um, if you value them, then th there'll be a lot uh, more lines. It's hard to see. So what I want to do is to show you a little bit about what the structure um, looks like and then get to some basic results. For those of you um, interested in network analysis, you need to tell me what time to open for discussion. <coughs> About 10 minutes. So really going to breeze through this. <laughs> um, this is a network map. And what it shows is neighborhoods. Um, and the, the circle is in proportion to the number of neighborhoods to which the focal neighborhood is sending a tie. Now, they may seem a little foreign to you, those who do network analysis in the audience will, will get it, but what it's doing is moving beyond now the idea of the nodal at attributes, that is, just the characteristics of the neighborhood, and now taking into account the connection between, let's say, this neighborhood and all other neighborhoods. So we're looking not only to who, which neighborhood is it sending ties, but how many. And the idea, just to motivate it, is that in the analysis to come is going to take all that into account, the number the flows, directions, and so forth, and basically ask the question, what is driving these flows beyond what we would expect on, on, on the uh, basis of chance and what we would expect on the basis of um, distance? Because, you know, people are, you know, less likely to move to, let's say, California than uh, another neighborhood in Chicago, and economic status. So what explains exchange? Um, that's the in degree, which is all the neighborhoods that received, all right, because we started with our sample and then they can move anywhere, and as you can see, it fills up pretty quickly. Um, one more map that shows you the extent, and really amazing extent, to which even in this day and age, the nature of mobility in Chicago is socially structured. So, for example, if you look at whites, and this is not census data now, these are our families moving over time. Whites are clustered in a particular area and, and on the southwest side. The African-American sample is very interesting. It, it has um, a number of different areas of concentration, but you notice it doesn't overlap, and I'll show you that more in a, in a minute. And Hispanics have another area. So we know there's racial and ethnic flows. Um, what else is going on? Well, um, in a recent paper um, with uh, Karina Greif, uh, a graduate student at Harvard, and in further analysis beyond that um, for the book, looking at um, three things. One is distance, directly contrary to the idea of death of distance. 
Structural distance, the idea being that the more similar neighborhoods are in terms of racial composition and income, the more likely there's going to be a tie in migration. That's not terribly surprising, although um, once you sort of take into account the, the let's say, family income, it's not um, immediately apparent what that pattern would be. And more interesting, I think, is the social climate. That is, are some of these mechanisms that we've been, uh, or I've been talking about um, relevant in terms of explaining this? And the answer is yes. And one of the things I want to mention, just briefly, because I have to move on, is the idea of disorder. And I've worked on this concept a lot. It's, it's both um, s simple, seemingly, and very complex, right? Because there's a whole theory out there, the broken windows theory. You've all heard about it. That disorder leads to crime. Well, that may or may not be true, but I think what's been understudied is really the... the way that perceptions and social meanings of disorder are constructed and play out. Because there's really two things that are going on. One is the actual disorder in the neighborhood. And we actually measured this through videotapes and counted up the number of um, broken bottles and, and uh, graffiti and what kind of graffiti and gang graffiti and people hanging out on the street and selling drugs and so forth. Mark and I could live in the same neighborhood, and you know there's garbage piled up. But if I asked him, how much of a problem is this? So it's a big problem, little problem. And you ask me, we might not disagree, uh, agree. And it turns out that people who live in the same neighborhood don't always agree, especially if there's racial differences. So the idea is that disorder, that is the the amount or however you want to think of it, is not the same thing as the evaluation, the meaning that is given to disorder. In our research, we show that the perceived disorder, what I think of as the collectively shared understandings of disorder, is a powerful predictor of a number of things. Not just crime, but now going beyond migration. And this is a little complex. I think I'm going to go over it quickly, um, given the time frame. But for those of you um, interested, what this is is an analysis that looks at all those flows, as I mentioned before, and assesses the similarities and differences based on Space, racial composition, median income, population density, crime rate, perceived disorder, friend and kinship ties, organizational participation, and the collective efficacy or the, the cohesion in the community. To make a long story short, the collectively perceived disorder has a significant relationship and another analysis, sometimes larger um, than income, and, in, in, for example, the neighborhood level, percent black is no longer significant. It's mediated through um, some of these other factors. So what's happening is these social characteristics are, in a way, part of what I think of as, as cultural um, homophily. That is, that there's sorting going on in a sort of macro-demographic sense among neighborhoods. So the idea of selection bias takes on a different cast, it seems, that it's not about so much or only individual selection, right, because that decision is never um, independent or autonomous, as the classic theory has it, but rather completely dependent on the structure or the system of flows. Let me pr show you this a little bit more. I've just <coughs> argued and shown that the disorder relationship is independent of the compositional characteristics. And when we break it down... It's at both ends. That is to say, it's not just circulation, let's say, among areas that are um, low in disorder to other low. It's also high to high. In other words, these are all the ties or flows from a, a neighborhood that's high in collectively perceived disorder to another neighborhood that's high in collectively perceived disorder. And what you see are, are basically clumps, spatially distinct, areas of population flows that are related to this social characteristic. And notice this red, I put this red circle around it. If you shift this over here, I mean, it's quite remarkable. that the, I mean, this is empty. There's just nothing going on here. And again, it's not just about race. It's not just about income. That there's something about the social quality of the neighborhoods. Now, my hypothesis is, and based on further work, I don't have time to get into it here, is that a lot of this has to do with reputations and the way that reputations influence mobility flows. And you, we, we all sort of partake in this, right? That such and such a neighborhood is this, another is that, or students live here, or there's good rents there, um, foreclosures going on there, that's a disorderly neighborhood. 
and they are mediated by organizations, real estate, um, organizations was one of our um, factors, but it's also cultural, I think, so that people's perceptions of disorder and what they're comfortable with in terms of street activity are, are sorted in a very um, systematic way. So what I would argue then is that spatial distance matters a lot. Um, I'm going to set that aside. Structural distance, yes, income and race matter a lot, but social climate similarity is important to it. And I should note that this holds up um, in our recent analysis when we do subgroup analysis. So what we did, for example, is to say, let's take household heads that are clinically depressed and those that are not, and then see where they move. Let's take low, medium, and high family income, and let's take um, family criminality, which is defined here based on both self-reported data of domestic violence in the home, plus a criminal record, official criminal record, usually of a male associated with the caretaker in the house. And then we looked at criminal and non-criminal flows. The basic finding is that th those patterns of, for example, income, homophily, and social disorder, homophily, are holding up, which I find to be quite interesting. So in a classic sense, this is what we would call a contextual analysis. Okay, I want to try to keep to your um, suggestion, but just motivate it a little, um, a little bit more and, and, and wrap up to push the idea of collectively perceived disorder, that it's not just shaping crime. In fact, collectively perceived disorder is related to later poverty. This is in 1995, predicting the poverty rate in 2000. And you might say, well, okay, that makes sense, but we would expect there to be a correlation between the poverty rate and the actual disorder. So, and this is based on a, um, a paper recently published, Actually, it's really powerful, even when we take into account poverty itself, that is, proportion families in poverty in 1990. So the, the model here is, right, prior poverty and then poverty in 2000, then taking into account violence, racial composition, immigration, and the rate of measured or observed disorder. And what you see is that it has, that has no effect, but the prediction for collectively perceived disorder, along with poverty, I'm not saying it's not important, and along with racial composition, is there. So what it's saying is that the trajectory of a neighborhood, because it's really about change, it's about the trajectory or the pathway that a neighborhood is taking, is being influenced by these social um, flows and characteristics. Uh, I, I'm going to skip over this, but I wanted to, well, to tell you, which is why I think the, the analysis of the flows between neighborhoods is relevant. Um, and another matter is that these are the, all the key informants. Um, these are not named. If you guess who's in the center, but I won't name him or her. Um, we then coded these all by community. And in fact, you can think of communities as being a network. So right, instead of migration, now think of the connections that are formed when the alderman that covers Hyde Park needs to get something done in Hyde Park and goes to um, you know, someone downtown or near North Side, or you need a development, you know, lot 37. Or you know, we're looking at zoning, we're looking at budgeting, and looking at how connections map on. And there's a structure to this. And surprisingly enough, perhaps, that structure based on organizational flows is significantly related to the migration flows. What that tells me is that there's such a thing as, and it sounds a little bit of um, jargon perhaps, but that the sorting, that's why I started with the sort of individual level way of thinking about the world. In part, maybe a better way to think about it is structural sorting. That yes, you're sorting, but neighborhoods are also sorting you in a way, right, that both are going on. So the idea that we are um, the controlling factor is, is a bit misleading. And selection bias, I think, has been misunderstood. And this is an attempt to understand selection, to go right to it, say, no, it's not a problem, it's a social process, and here's how it works. 
And that's a neighborhood effect because the, the selection itself is based on the characteristics of the context. So it makes no sense at some level, if you follow the logic, to control for the context to look at the individual effect because that's, in fact, part of the decision. Importance of social quality of life and re recognizing stability and change. Um, this is a, a way maybe to think about the three um, levels of that's, – that's the working title, by the way, in case you wanted to know. Um, the book that will have all of this and more will be coming out next um, summer, probably, um, University of Chicago Press. Uh, can be slow, but um, we'll see. The idea is that even if I grant that individual selection in a methodologically individualistic way is – is it sort of at the center, at the bottom? You think about bottom up. <coughs> the spatial dynamics and the higher order structures, some of which I've talked about, have their own causal logic and have their own measurement properties. That's the idea of ecometrics. That's why I think methodological individualism is wrong because you can't just start here and turn, turn this because everything else is turning and interrelated. And the neighborhood effects... I'm not here to say the neighborhood effects are the most important thing in the world. I never said that, and that's, that would be silly. Um, I don't think we really know, actually, partly because it is a structure, it is an interlocking structure of these higher order um, dynamics. And what the book does is to go through um, basically one section. Um, the first section starts with the traditional neighborhood effects and looks at the neighborhood level processes, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the the theory for that in a second. And then has a section on, okay, now let's take individual selection processes and mobility and choice into account and see how that um, works in relation to this. And then finally, the higher order structures. And what, again, what I mean by that is beyond the border of the neighborhood, not about an indigenous characteristic of the neighborhood, but rather the relationship between the neighborhood and the rest of the city. And three things that I've been working with um, which I think are really important for health and, and perhaps for this audience that I don't have time to describe, but that come out of this and sort of hold up based on a lot of these analysis are the collective efficacy of a community, which uh, we've written on and has to do with the, the nature of um, shared expectations for control and cohesion in a community. It's altruistic character, which is not necessarily the same thing, but can be measured behavioral uh, indicators like returning lost letters, CPR, whatever. And moral and legal cynicism, which I will set aside, but I think is an important cultural mechanism that has to do with sort of the corrosive nature or perceived nature of, of institutions and, and the legitimacy of, for example, the police and other um, community norms. And the, the collective efficacy part uh, we've written on a lot that tries to take into account the individual characteristics and selection processes, um, the macro level processes, and how both the, the traditional neighborhood characteristics are mediated um, by collective efficacy, but that there's also a reciprocal um, relationship. But if we go back to this, I think, um, and I'll just end by saying that um, I think it has implications as well, and it's in the book, I don't have time to talk about it, for policy and intervention. Because I think it, it suggests that the medical model um, and even experiments as they're traditionally conceived are, are perhaps misguided. Because they assumed in independent actors and that's incorrect. They assume an equilibrium, um, which doesn't necessarily exist. And even if one intervenes at the level of the neighborhood, it assumes that that, again, will stay the same, and it doesn't take into account um, the nature of the relationships. And if we just use, for example, um, you know, interview, intervening to take down Robert Taylor Holmes or the moving to opportunity experiment where we move people out of poverty, um, that's fine. We move people out of Cabrini Green. Um, then it looks better, but those people moved somewhere, and the neighborhoods where they moved are part of this interlocking structure. So if nothing else, policy evaluation needs to evaluate in a dynamic fashion what is going on. But it also, again, um, calls into question of what is the unit of analysis and what should be the unit of intervention. And I end with um, an argument for at least an equal... Um, time, if you will, for more macro or public health-like interventions, where the intervention is not at the individual level, but rather takes into account knowledge about how individuals make choices and the, the nature of moves, but essentially um, intervenes to um, renew um, existing structures rather than um, 
only blow up the old ones, if I can say it that harshly. So um, I think I'll end. Uh, the, uh, the one thing I didn't hear you say uh, anything about, which surprises me, mm -hmm. is education in this. I'm sure it tracks with everything. It may be what a lot of people think might be the lever, the way to uh, intervene. Can you speak yeah. about education, measures of the quality of education, whether it's high school, graduation rates, whatever it is, but I'm sure, sure it's part of the mix. Yes. Um, it is, although I would probably say it's, it's not um, in the mix as much as it, it should be. Uh, there are several people on the project that are deeply interested in education and are working on it. Um, and we've done several analysis, for example, one, one looking at um, school dropout, which is a key uh, mechanism in terms of life chances. And what that analysis shows, particularly work by David Kirk and then an article we have coming out on the relationship between neighborhood effects, but also experiences with the criminal justice system in terms of school dropout. So it is a piece of it um, that's been independently analyzed. Um, two other things. I, I would say that in all this analysis, it's, it's there and it's important um, depending on the, the nature of um, what we're studying. So for example, in terms of the mobility, housing, it was sort of in the background, I just didn't have time to emphasize, but education um, is very important. What we didn't do is analyze education as an outcome with the following exception. Um, we did <coughs> excuse me, spend a lot of uh, time and attention on the um, younger children's um, experiences and uh, measured um, test taking and verbal and, and, and mental um, abilities, depending on how you want to interpret the test. So for example, uh, we published a paper on verbal ability among six, nine, and 12-year-olds based on the Weschler Bellevue and other tests. And what we found, and this has also been found now in two other studies in Chicago, so it's been replicated across three studies, is that living in or growing up in severely concentrated disadvantaged neighborhoods um, sets back has a, or has a lagged effect on verbal ability, um, and we estimate that to be about the equivalent of missing a year in school. So it was about four to six points on the IQ scale. That is, when you norm the verbal ability, quote, IQ test, you can then estimate the, the loss, if you will, um, educationally, to living in severely concentrated disadvantaged neighborhoods. The important um, part about that, I think, is that the effect maintained and was lagged, so it was an essential developmental effect. So even if one moved out of poverty, but had, let's say, grown up in that, that there was still a lingering deficit in terms of the uh, ability. So that's a powerful um, finding if, um, corroborated because it suggests, well, it suggests a number of things that one cannot just focus in on escape from poverty right, as a solution if, in fact, early childhood has been characterized by all the things that I've been talking about. And that's part of the argument, right, is that childhood, and, and it's partly how I end the book, is that we really need to, I believe, link child development policies with community intervention policies more holistically. You know, there are, there are ways that we're doing this, but I think, for example, some of the voucher programs are taking kids out, but after they've been exposed for a number of years to learning environments that are um, less than satisfactory. And if there's lag effects, then there, there may be difficulties in that. And secondly, um, the equilibriums that will then reassert themselves if people move and then new inequalities are, are created that we don't anticipate, so the unintended consequences. So um, I think some of the, the policies with regard to, let's say, the Harlem Children's Zone and some of the vouchers are, are somewhat um, problematic. But that's a long way of saying, yes, education is important. Um, and that's how, 
that's how we analyzed it, but it's really um, tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more one could do. Um, I have a question too, maybe related. Um, we measure crime uh, in a poor neighborhood, mm -hmm. but a crime is not only physical. Uh, crime is, uh, if I were simplistically say, when you rob people from their health or financial mm -hmm. or freedom. Mm -hmm. And so when you get 10% uh, to 15% of medical expenses in this country, is crime of a stealing. And this is not in a bad neighborhood. Sure. It's done throughout the country by doctors and lawyers and uh, anyone who could do it. Yes. So we only measure here crime of a physical. And uh, one of the things is that um, I found out that uh, somebody throw out uh, purses with money in it uh, in a various country. Hmm. And I find out that um, in the uh, uh, U.S. and England and Mexico, somewhere about uh, only 30% of the people return it hmm. to a place, while in Sweden, and uh, Belgium and those areas was only about 2%. So the attitude of the country and proneness to crime, I suppose it uh, in, uh, make a difference. Yeah. Whether it wants to be a crime in a physical, in a bad neighborhood, or would be financial in a good neighborhood. So if you had a prescription to do something, what would you do? Well, first of all, I think the point is an excellent one in terms of what we're talking about here with regard to crime. So this um, study and some of those maps that I showed earlier on homicide and so forth, these are indeed interpersonal crimes of violence, chosen in part um, because of the fact that these types of violent crimes in particular um, seem to be, based on the research, so detrimental to children's health and to the trajectories of communities. Um, as an aside, there's an interesting paper that, that recently came out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences showing that um, witnessing violence or having a homicide occur like on the street close to <coughs> one's home for children had a really negative effect on learning for those kids using a kind of a quasi-experimental design. So I think the issue is what kinds of crimes are we talking about and what kinds of effects do they have? Um, so that's why we looked at more violent and street crimes. The kinds of crimes you're talking about um, are fundamentally important. I think they are, in a sense, at least um, conceptually, incorporated um, not so much from the perspective of crime, but in the, in the work and in the model at, at this higher order level, which is to say that the way that communities, for example, are, are laid out, the nature of segregation, um, planned communities, income distributions, um, social services, all these things are more macro level that um, are not about the individuals and the communities making decisions. And you could argue that, you know, it's a, quote, crime, right, that um, services are, are diverted from one community into another. That could be corruption or it could be a different kind of crime. Um, it may be that taxation policies are unfairly harming certain communities. So I totally agree with you that um, I would even, you know, maybe think about it more generally in terms of the kinds of, I guess the way I conceptualize is alloca allocation policies that affect how, that, that's why I think neighborhoods are, I mean, they're endogenous in the sense that that's been one of the critiques all along of neighborhood effects. It doesn't mean they're not important. It's just that they are subject to these forces and allocation policies that um, have to do with a number of things. Foreclosure crisis maybe is the best example of what you're saying. I mean, some communities right here in Chicago are now being hit really hard with foreclosures. And a lot of those decisions were, I would say, criminal. <laughs> I mean, malfeasance, um, incompetent, if you, if you don't want to say criminal, right? Um, but they certainly weren't um, street crimes. So I totally agree with you. I think it's captured, though, in, in the theoretical way to think about how policies and organizational decisions uh, affect that. And finally, um, the cross-country stuff is fascinating. Um, it's, it's like the letter drop stuff, too. You see differences. Sometimes it's not quite you, what you'd expect. One of our studies here compared um, Chicago and Stockholm. It was interesting that you mentioned um, Sweden. I think some, um, I have to look at that study more. Sometimes I think putting money in the person 
confound some things um, depending on the poverty level of, of the country. But I, I think the cross-national comparisons are are great. And right now there's about um, four or five studies ongoing that have, have used some of these measures in Australia, London, uh, Stockholm, Africa, and Tanzania, Moshi to be precise, um, and then several other cities in the United States. So we're going to have more cross-cultural data shortly. Thank you so much. My understanding is that there are much wider disparities in wealth compared to income. Is that relevant for this discussion? Yes. So um, the question is that um, it, there seems to be more disparities in wealth, right, relative to income. And I think uh, that that is correct. We have not looked at disparities in, in wealth, although we have looked at disparities with regard to the neighborhood level in terms of more upper end um, kinds of characteristics, such as percent in professional managerial occupations, percent college educated, and so forth, which tends to be highly correlated with wealth. The problem is that um, we don't have real good measures, a lot of people don't actually, of wealth. Also, um, at the neighborhood level, um, I think one can get at that in part through the the median income, although, as you say, uh, median income doesn't capture it all, although it is, it is correlated. I think that's a, it's a tall order. Um, I, I think it's an important one to get it how you can conceive of and measure sort of community-level differences in, in wealth. The individual level, there's much more advances that have been made on this. Some um, sociologists have, have tackled this problem. Um, so I can't really say, actually, um, how it would play out other than my hypothesis would be it would exacerbate, you know, these differences would, would be as pronounced if not perhaps more pronounced. Good point. Rob, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the developmental trajectories of children um, in the context of the development of a neighborhood and, and thinking both about the intersection of, of the context of that neighborhood and where, where a kid is in the life course, but also in thinking about um, lag effects of neighborhoods. So if one is in a neighborhood until age six, how long does one carry that influence yep, of yep. the neighborhood through yeah. life? Yeah, so um, the question here is really about developmental effects of neighborhoods. And one way to think about this is to, to make the contrast stark is that you could have, imagine two kinds of neighborhood effects. This is oversimplification, but one is more situational, right, so that you have a particular context Let's say in, in a, a community context, let's say here in Hyde Park, where you walk out um, after this to lunch or, or whatnot, and something happens or there's, uh, um, you know, a letter's dropped on the street or there's a potential crime, you know, do people do anything or not? Or what is the nature of the effect of that context on what's happening then or even in this seminar? This seminar is a context, right? Someone asked a question. The, 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 sort of a contemporaneous effect and then it's gone. Um, now, that's a real causal effect, and uh, my belief is that um, a lot of the patterns that we see, especially for things like street crimes, are more contemporaneous in nature. But the different kind of effect might well be that individuals are, especially kids, don't just live in a bubble, right? They live in a neighborhood, but they're also in many neighborhoods during the day. And it could well be that if one, let's say, grows up in a certain context, high crime environment or high poverty neighborhood, that that sort of is mediated by learning perceptions, interactions with others, such that, for example, a suspicion, a cynicism about interpersonal relations, such that when you're in another context of perceived um, remark or an insult might be seen to be um, necessary for you to, to attack back, right? Because a lot of interpersonal um, events like that seem to be rooted in, in these misunderstandings. And that is based on learning patterns. So that's an example of where growing up and living in certain kinds of environments can have long-term effects. I think that's what we showed um, with respect to some of the, the learning in terms of the verbal ability. Others using the PhD SAN data, I believe, have um, shown some developmental effects for other things in terms of um, 
delinquency, um, sexual um, behavior, and so forth. I think it's still a, you know, it's a research question that has not been fully articulated. I don't think we know like all the different characteristics, but I do think what is useful is to make that analytic distinction. And using the example of the kid who right, goes out in different neighborhoods and may be affected no matter where he or she is, it's not, it's not um, incompatible that at the same time, despite his or her impulsivity or um, nature of interpretation of relationships, if you're in, a, let's say, a, you know, after school and you're in a park and there's drug use and there's no um, supervision, then you may be more likely to engage, let's say, in, in drug use. And in a way, that's a neighborhood effect because it's the context that's affecting you, but it's not your home residence. So partly where the, I think the literature has gone wrong is to assume it's only about your home residence. Taking the neighborhood as the unit of analysis, which a lot of our work does, is more about that situational context effect. The developmental one is more where you live and then how it affects you no matter where you go. So it clarifies the counterfactual, if you will. Marshall, uh, you'll have the last word, the last question. So, so I was wondering, when you speak to a lay audience, what your message is. Because in one sense, one can say, well, you know, this is just the old American dream story that, you know, you try to have your family live in the best neighborhood possible for education, for quality of life. Um, and so, you know, a lot of similar correlations. Yeah, and at the same time, you're, you're maybe saying, well, maybe the American dream is a myth and that you mentioned like there's relatively little transition across different strata uh, in one of your slides. So in terms of like, the practical message for like, the general public, what are the insights you have that you stress when you give the talk to the general public? Ah, <laughs> I don't like those. No. Um, so a couple things. I wouldn't say you know I'm not, this is not an anti-American um, dream. Although what I would say is you know you look at those early slopes of neighborhood attainment, and yes, you move up, but you know everything's relative, and there's a a deep structure to all this that's not about you, <laughs> right? And so, the, I mean, that's an important message we don't like to hear. But the positive side to that, um, and more and more in my career, I think more like a population health person. And that's where I think the medical model, not the individual medical model, but more of a population health model, makes a lot of sense. Because what it says is it's not so much about you or me or intervening in that level. It's about changing the norms and the structures that allow those lines, right, to, to get, to, to converge. And, and that um, is more abstract, but I think it's important because it does have a very practical implications depending on whether you're thinking about um, disease or, I mean, you can look at, um, I found it intriguing, um, I was writing an article on looking at experiments and observational research. You know, the CDC came out with a, a very interesting descriptive report on um, longevity from 1900 to 2000, over 100 years, you know, life expectancy went up. I mean, this is a great success, right? Um, by, what, 25, 30 years, something like huge. And then they listed the, quote, top 10 reasons for that. Except for one, they were all observationally based, and they were about macro population health kinds of policies, about smoking, about um, automobile improvement, um, fluoridation, and so on and so forth. Now, you know, that may seem simplistic, but if you think about it, it, it's not, because when you change norms and you change macro-level um, consequences like that, you get big effects in population health. That's not trying to change an individual. So I think the same analogy works, and it works when you start to put these different pieces together and thinking about intervening at that level. So I say that, look, if you can do it for longevity, for health, certainly we can help improve things like education um, and so forth, if not, you know, even, you know, individual lives. And so that's why I'm um, actually uh, perhaps, not surprisingly, um, fairly optimistic about um, policies because it does logically anyway lead to a set of um, doable things that are, I think, more cost-effective than individual level. Uh, and one of the main reasons is, as you probably all know, we can't predict very well at the individual level. And part of what you see here is that structures are very stable, so we do know where to intervene. Please join me in thanking Professor. Thank you.